microeconomics, we're going to start with elasticity uh, for the beginning of this term. We're going to cover the elasticity definitions, the types of elasticities, the formula applications, and also the economic modeling and some form of potential tax analysis if we have time in relation to elasticity. So elasticity itself, uh, it's in economics is used to define how consumers respond to changes in prices in the market. So essentially, we're looking at elasticity as a measure of market participant and how sensitive or how responsive consumers, households, firms are in the economy to price changes. More specifically, we're looking at price elasticity of demand, which measures the ratio of the percent change in price over the percent change in the quantity demanded. We're going to analyze this in a particular definition theory, mathematical calculations, and graphical modeling. Now, we have two different types of uh, elasticity behaviors, elastic consumer demand and inelastic consumer demand. Consumers that are elastic in this case are very sensitive to price changes. They tend to create a large change in the quantity demanded when a price changes. Uh, and we refer to this as elastic consumers, consumers that respond a lot. Think about elasticity as highly responsive or not as responsive. The other one is inelastic consumers. When consumers are not so responsive or are insensitive to price changes. Prices increase, but consumer response doesn't change much. So we're looking at a small change in quantity demanded by consumers. Consumers buy close to the same amount uh, of the units as before the price change or even the same amount, even if the price increases. Now, elasticity can be calculated using the midpoint method. We're going to calculate elasticity um, with the average midpoint uh, of the starting and final values. We can use two formulas, midpoint method and also a regular method. For the purpose of this class, we're going to use the midpoint method. Price elasticity of demand, uh, in this case, the midpoint method formula, uh, it's a little bit extensive and all of the solutions for elasticity of demand are expressed in absolute value for demand only. We're looking at the formula to be price elasticity of demand is equal to the changes in quantities the new quantity versus the original quantity divided by the average value of quantities and divided by two. We'll take this change in quantity and divide it by the price change. The new price, in this case P2 minus P1, divided by the average value of prices. When we compute this method, we get a mathematical solution to help us explain uh, consumer behavior through calculations and also give some meaning to elasticity. The secondary formula that it's used, it's the regular method formula. Both of them use the absolute value. The main difference in the formulas, in this case, is as follows. The price elasticity of demand abbreviated here is a percent change in the quantity demanded over the percent change in price. However, if you notice the change in the formula here, we're not taking the average values as it is in the midpoint method. We're taking the changes in quantity from quantity two minus quantity one, over the original quantity divided by price of two minus price one over the original price one. And if we're doing it in percentages, we multiply times 100 and this cancel out since they're divided by 100 each. Where Q1 is the initial quantity demanded at the original price of one, Q2 is the quantity two at the higher, at the change in price of price of two. And both formulas can be used but depending on which formula is applied, it has to do with the question. When we're looking at the uh, scenarios that can be used, how can we use elasticity or how do we know when to use elasticity, typically has to do with price changes. If we look at the demand for vaccination for any important vaccine, it could be the COVID-19 vaccine, uh, malaria vaccination, or any important vaccine, at the current price of $20, we have 10 individual, 10 million consumers that need the vaccine. But if there's an increase in the price of vaccines from $20 to $50, there's going to be a slight change in the quantity demanded from point A to point B. Quantity demanded drops from 10 to eight. And in this case, we're looking at a higher price 
only 8, cons 8 million consumers want to consume the vaccine. And at $20, 10 million wants to consume the vaccine. So there's a, uh, there's a slight response. But if you look at the price, the price increased significantly more. So when the price rises to $50 per vaccination, the world quantity demanded falls to $8 million per vaccine from the original 10. So there, this indicates a slight response, a small response. This is considered inelastic behavior. Again, inelastic is when there's not a lot of response. Consumers still consume close to the same amount. So we're going to calculate the elasticity of demand using the midpoint method uh, for the demand for vaccine. And this is something why vaccine is so important and uh, that we need to have we still need to consume the same amount of vaccines. So calculating the demand for vaccinations using the midpoint method um, in this case. Now we look at uh, the price elasticity of demand formula. We have to take the changes in quantity over the average value. Changes in price over the average value of prices. Here we have two different quantities. Quantity is uh, decreased to eight minus the original 10 million. And then we average the value and divide it by two. We apply this to the price, which is price of two, which is $50, minus the original lower price of 20, and then add the average value together and divide it by two. And after we run through the process of elasticity, notice how we have a negative sign. Since we're consuming less units, there's a negative decline in this case. And the process indicates that price elasticity of demand is 0.259. The solution is expressed in absolute value. Take the absolute value of the solution for interpretation purposes. Price elasticity of, uh, uh, in this case of demand, is 0.25, which is less than one. When it's less than one, it is considered to be price inelastic, meaning that consumers are not as responsive to higher prices. They still need the vaccine, especially if it's important vaccines. So meaning the vaccinations are needed in this case, regardless of price. If it's less than one, it's inelastic, and consumer response is limited, you have to pay the price. So let's take a look at the possible solutions of elasticity. The possible solutions of elasticity include that if demand is elastic, the price elasticity of demand is greater than one, consumers tend to respond a lot more to a change in price, meaning that if the price increases, consumers are gonna respond a lot by either consuming more or consuming less. When demand is inelastic, not as responsive, very limited, the price elasticity of demand solution is less than one. The consumer response does not change as much and they still buy the same, close to the same amount, uh, even if the price has changed. When price elasticity of demand is exactly one, we have a situation that is referred to as unit elastic. Unit elastic in this case, it means that for every one unit or for every 1% unit increase in price, the percent in quantity changes by the same unit. Uh, so this is a more of a neutral response. Uh, there's uh, not a significant change when it's unit elastic. Now, we uh, need to continue in uh, interpreting elasticity as it is very technical in meaning and calculation and sometimes in graphical illustrations. There are two extreme cases. And the most extreme situation is when the price elasticity of demand is perfectly inelastic, meaning that the demand curve, it's a vertical line and the price elasticity of demand is equal to zero. After we do the calculations, the solution will indicate a zero. Perfectly inelastic demand, the solution is zero. And we have a graphical illustration where the demand is vertical, it's upward sloping. On the other extreme case, if the demand is perfectly elastic, the demand curve is a horizontal line, meaning that consumers are highly responsive, infinitely responsive. When we're looking at perfectly elastic, the demand is vertical, uh, it's horizontal uh, in this case. It's perfectly uh, horizontal, infinite line. Let's look at the economic graphs for both of these two scenarios. So the graph number two will indicate a perfectly inelastic demand curve when the price elasticity of demand is equal to zero. And let's take a look at what this could be. So we have one person demanding uh, a particular product, in this case, anti-venom. Suppose we have one person that is hiking in the uh, Hollywood Hills, and this person gets bitten by a poisonous rattlesnake. 
that one person that is demanding the anti-venom immediately. So if it's $1,000, you still need the anti-venom. If it increases to $5,000, so this, this is one individual demands the anti-venom. This is an extreme situation as not everybody gets bitten by a poisonous uh, a snake or needs anti-venom for certain things. So if the price is 1000 the consumer still demands the same amount of units, which in this case is the anti-venom. If the price rises to 5000 the consumer still needs the product. This is referred to as a price, uh, in this case, inelastic condition where the price elasticity is perfectly inelastic demand. As price rises, it leaves the quantity demanded unchanged. You still buy the same amount regardless price. This is when regardless price, you have to buy this product at this price. It could be $10,000, you still need to have it. The second case is when the demand, in the most extreme case, is when the demand curve is perfectly elastic, perfectly elastic, it's highly responsive. If you like having pizza, uh, we have a good, a good company that most of you are familiar with that set their standard price for five, at $5 for their standard pizza, pepperoni and cheese. At $5, the demand for pizza, in theory, is infinitely large. Consumer response is very significant. You can demand a lot of pizza at, at a standard price of five, hypothetically speaking. So you can buy a significantly large quantity. And since it's an extreme situation, uh, if the price increases even more, your quantity demand that drops to zero, but if it's even cheaper, you buy infinitely, infinitely more. So elasticity helps us measure how responsive consumers can be in certain price situations. Now, in the unit elastic condition, when the demand uh, for goods and services um, is elastic, unit elastic or inelastic, there could be a combination of somewhere in between. It's not always two extremes. So graph number four here is going to indicate a situation where we have a unit elastic demand when the price elasticity of demand is equal to one. It's not infinite and it's not zero, but it's equivalent to one. So in this case, we have a bridge crossing scenario. We we'll cross bridges and we have to pay the toll. So if we look at the 90 cent price for the toll to cross the bridge, we have 1,100 consumers that use the bridge daily. And if the price increases to $1.10, uh, only 900 individuals, in this case, quantity demand that drops to 900, and we have an increase in price by approximately uh, 20%, and the quantity demanded has changed by 200 units for approximately 20% as well. Price elasticity of demand is the percent change in the quantity demanded, which is 20%, over the percent change in price. 20% divided by 20% is equal to one. So meaning that uh, it doesn't really affect much the revenue potential margins of the company, or in this case of crossing a bridge when we look at revenue um, calculations. So we have a unit situation where between point A and point B, the price elasticity of demand it's approximately equivalent to one or equal to one. Depending on which formula you use, you're very close to one or exactly one. Now, when we're looking at inelastic demand, uh, inelastic demand is when demand curve is a little bit steep. The demand curve is very steep. We can increase the price from 90 cents uh, at where, uh, in this case, at which uh, 1150, uh, 1050 consumers use the product but if we increase the price by 20% uh, or to a dollar ten cents, which in this case we're increasing price by 20%, the quantity demanded drops only by 100 units or by 10%. So in this case, you have a higher increase in price when it's inelastic, you have a higher increase in price, but a lower response in quantity demanded. Inelastic behavior is referred to situations in which the price increases more, significantly more in percentage-wise, and the quantity demanded changes very small, very little, or not as much. The last situation here is when we have elastic demand. Elastic. There's several technical ones. Elastic. 
and the demand curve is a little bit flatter. So we have the same price. We're starting at the same price. At 90 cents, we have 1,200 individuals across the bridge. And if we increase the price, notice that we're increasing the price by 20%, by the same percentage, 20%, to $1.10. Then here we have a higher response where consumers buy uh, across the bridge in significantly less quantities. So here we have 1,200 and now we have only 800. Depending on what type of consumers we have, elastic, inelastic, unit elastic, the quantity is going to respond by different percentages or by different quantities. In this case, significantly more if it's elastic. If it's elastic, a 20% increase in price leads to a 40% decrease in the quantity demanded per day, meaning that it actually affects consumers more when it's elastic, depending on the situation. Now, elasticity helps predict how the changes in price of a good can actually affect the total revenue by firms and producers, which is why it's important. We want to know if increasing the price is going to lower quantity demand a lot because it affects the revenue of the firm. Total revenue is uh, defined by uh, the price of goods and services times the quantity of units sold. Very standard. Profit is a little bit different. Now, if we look at the area of total revenue using the demand curve, the demand curve is um, downward sloping. At 90 cents, we have 1,100 riders across the bridge, and we take our we take our 90 cents times 1,100. That will give us our total revenue, in this case, at $990. The scenarios that we analyzed first were to increase the price, but that's going to affect the quantity demanded. And if you notice, total revenue is the area below the demand curve between the price of 90 cents and the units demanded. When the price changes, this area is going to change as well. We're gonna have a price effect. If you increase the price, you're gonna have a higher, a higher price per unit, but the quantity is going to be affected. So when we're looking at the situation, when a seller raises the price of a good, there are two uh, effects in action. The first effect is the price effect, meaning that with a higher price per unit, then there's more revenue to receive per unit uh, given the price increase and vice versa. If you lower the price, the revenue drops by the price that has been decreased. It's a price effect. However, the law of demand indicates that changes in prices lead to a change in quantity, as a reminder. When we change the price, the quantity changes, but there's an opposing effect. The quantity effect means that due to the price change, people may either buy more or less. So they work in opposite direction. Elasticity helps us solve this issue by determining to what type of consumers can the price be changed. If it's elastic consumer, inelastic, or unit elastic consumers. It's important to note that not always a higher price means more revenue. Charging a higher price doesn't always guarantee more revenue. Uh, we have to determine the type of consumers that we're looking at because it can actually be counterproductive. Let's take a look at the graphical illustration. We started with our 90 cents uh, graphical area and analyzing the price increase. Area B indicates the total revenue of 90 cents times 900 riders. And if we increase the price to $1.10, we're going to lose some consumers um, that we're willing to pay in this case 90 cents because we're charging them a little bit more and you have a higher price per unit but you have lost uh, in this case 200 units from 1100 to 900. Area 8 indicates the quantity effect. 1100 uh, consumers will buy at 90, uh, 90 cents, 1100 consumers will buy the product or cross a bridge but with a higher price you have a price effect, you have a higher revenue per unit, but in this situation, uh, you may lose some uh, units consumed. It is possible that they can offset each other. It's important to note price effects and quantity effects can offset one another. You can have the same revenue at a different price, but it really depends on elasticity. Now, 
how does how do we know how does revenue affect it? And if revenue is going to be the same if we increase the price, well, if demand is elastic, an increase in price may reduce total revenue. If you lower prices, it may increase revenue. So it really depends on what direction you're changing prices to. The quantity effect may be stronger than the price effect and price and revenue move in the opposite direction. So here, if, the, if demand is elastic, an increase in the price may potentially lower revenue. But if you lower prices, with lower prices, consumers may demand higher quantities because the quantity effect is stronger and it actually may actually push revenue up instead of lowering it. So it really depends on what direction prices change. If demand is inelastic for certain goods, you can increase the price, consumers will still buy close to the same amount, and it may increase revenue. With inelastic products, the price effect is stronger than the quantity effect and consumers buy the product regardless of the price. Price and revenue move in the same direction with inelastic goods. Now, if the man is unit elastic, unit elastic for every 1% change in price, quantity demand that changes by the same unit, an increase in price does not change total revenue. And this is a situation where you can increase the price, but if you have a, a unit elastic consumer, the revenue is going to stay the same. The sales effect and the price effect offset one another. Uh, so in this situation, the price change doesn't really change revenue. It's the same condition. This is important for pricing analyst positions uh, or analyzing the market when to change prices and how to do so. Now, the demand curve, if you notice, has different elasticities. Along the demand curve, we're going to experience different units demanded at different prices. Here we have one unit that is demanded at $9. Uh, in this case, the quantity demanded at $1 uh, at for nine. Um, uh, yes, the quantity demanded at $9 is one. The quantity demanded at uh, approximately, uh, for uh, approximately $8 is two units and so on. With lower prices, if you lower the price to $5, the quantity demanded increases to five units. If you lower the price even more to $3, quantity demanded drop increases to seven. Elasticity changes throughout the demand curve. If we look at the uh, price of five dollars uh, and five units demanded, and specifically at that point in time, we have a unit um, elastic condition. And if we go to the uh, upper uh, part of the model, increasing the price uh, reduces the quantity demanded and it lowers revenue, it pushes revenue downward. With higher prices, consumers buy fewer units, and with fewer units purchased, revenue actually drops. This is when demand is elastic. Higher prices of eight, nine, 10, reduces quality demand, and it reduces potential revenue. To the bottom part of the demand curve, if we are operating in the inelastic portion, uh, you increase the price, from one to two to three, uh, you may buy a little bit less, but your revenue is going to increase slightly. Demand is inelastic in this part of the, of the model, and increasing the price may increase uh, total revenue. So the demand changes along the demand curve. It's important to consider. Price elasticity of demand is influenced by several factors, and is determined by the availability of close substitutes uh, if the good is a necessity or a luxury, if it's a necessity, the individuals will buy the product regardless of the price. If it's a luxury, some individuals will buy luxuries that they may not need uh, and may have the willingness to buy it. But essentially, elasticity is determined by several factors that include necessities versus luxury items. The income that is spent in some of the goods, how much income it takes away from your pocket, your time and uh, other factors that influence price elasticity of demand. Over time, consumers are more sensitive to certain things in the market. This is when we link in timing to consumption. Elasticity can change over periods of time. We have other elasticities that are important. One of them is cross price elasticity. And cross price elasticity of demand 
it measures the effect of a change, uh, uh, measures the, the, the effect of a change in one goods price on the uh, quantity demanded of a different good, uh, of, of a different good. There's a price cross relationship analysis. You have two different goods that are costly related, good A and good B. The price of one good changes, you demand more of the other. And if the price of the other good changes, you demand more of the other product and vice versa. So we have a cross relationship behavior. The cross price elasticity of demand is a relationship between two different goods uh, that may be consumed together, that are complementary goods, that are substitute goods, or that are goods and services that have a relation, a cross price relation. So suppose we have, uh, in this case, peanut butter and jelly, good A and good B, peanut butter and jelly. How is the percent change in price of butter affecting the percent change, of, in this case, of uh, 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 jelly. You have two different goods. The price of one can affect the quantity demanded of the other. This is when they're costly related and you have a cross relationship. For this elasticity, we don't take the absolute value. The solutions are expressed in positive or negative because they explain an important concept. And we have two different goods that are costly related. If uh, the solution in this case is positive. When the cross price elasticity of demand is positive, we have goods that are considered to be substitutes. For example, apparel, uh, Nike shoes versus Adidas shoes. Those are two perfectly substitutable goods. It's a matter of preference, which is consumed over the other by the consumer. So if the price of Nike increases significantly more, as a substitute, the quality demanded for the other product is going to increase and vice versa. You have substitute goods, there's a positive relationship. The increase in price of Nike shoes leads consumers to substitute alternatives, which is in this case, Adidas, and increase the quality demand for the other product. When the goods are complements, the cross price elasticity of demand is actually negative, meaning that if one becomes more expensive, you demand uh, less of the other, which is in this case what the negative sign uh, means. If uh, tuition becomes more expensive, you have to pay tuition, and you may not necessarily buy the entire full price book and look for an alternative. So they're complementary of each other. If things become more expensive, you demand a little bit less of the other item. The solutions here tell a story of what items we're looking at to consume. The third elasticity that we need to consider is the income elasticity of demand. Income elasticity of demand measures uh, the sensitivity of households uh, to the percent change in the uh, quantity demanded of goods and services due to percent changes in income. Essentially, uh, when your income changes, uh, how are consumers and households going to respond in the market? Are they going to consume more, consume less? And if so, can we analyze that market? Income elasticity of demand uh, is the percent change in the quantity demanded over percent changes in income. We can analyze this in the midpoint method and also the regular method. We're gonna be using the midpoint method for practical uh, analysis. And the solutions here are also expressed positive or negative. The midpoint method, uh, again, is the changes in quantity um, over the average value of quantity. So we have the changes in quantities over the average value of quantities. In this case, we're looking at the changes in um, quantities over the average value of quantities. And we have the changes in income over the um, average value of income, where income is expressed by the word I and quantity is expressed by quantity one or quantity two. So for example, if Kathy uh, recently uh, graduates from college and her, in, uh, her, her income increases uh, from $19,000 to $48,000 as an entry-level analyst. Uh, she now starts at forty-eight dollars to $50,000. She decides to increase the number of dining out with friends from once a week to eight or per month. So we need to calculate her income elasticity of demand using the midpoint method. The midpoint method allows us to see the response and behavior of people when their income increases or when their income de decline and what products they consume the most. So as an example, we have Kathy, she's making 19,000 in college. 
uh, when she graduates and enters the market, she now makes 48,000. She consumes um, more meals. Uh, here we're using uh, two. She's going to um, go out eat from two to eight. She's gonna eat two, uh, she's gonna go um, uh, out instead of going twice, she's gonna go eat uh, eight times uh, out of the month out dining. So we're using two, uh, two, two, uh, two, two dining times per month and to eight, eight dining times. So quantity two here is uh, eight. Uh, quantity one is, uh, in this case, uh, two units. And the average value of both divided by uh, two, given the formula, divided by two. And the income changes as well. Once we calculate the income changes, we find that the price, of the income elasticity of demand, in this case, it's equivalent to 1.2, 1.42. The solution is greater than one and is actually positive. So it indicates a normal income elastic good, meaning that when individuals earn more income, they tend to spend a little bit more, which is a natural behavior. They tend to consume a little bit more and so on. There's a note in the formula here uh, the average value is always divided by two. So that's why this two is added here. So quantity one plus quantity two divided by two. That two has to be divided here. Uh, just as it is stated here in the formula. Q, uh, it, it depends on how it's analyzed. Q2 minus Q1 divided by Q1 plus Q2 divided by two. So we have this, uh, this formula here. We, we need that two, the, the lower two. Uh, in order to get this calculation, uh, this is the actual formula with the numerical values. Now, uh, if the solution is positive and greater than one, we're looking at a normal good and normal consumption. Quantity demanded increases given the prices, uh, given the uh, uh, income increases as well. So when we're looking at a income elasticity of demand when it's positive uh, and it's greater than one, that's a normal behavior. Quantity demand for goods and services given the price, it increases uh, as income rises, which is a normal behavior. With more income, people buy better cars, travel, uh, spend a little bit more, and go out to eat a little bit more. It's a normal behavior if it's positive. If the solution is negative, if income elasticity of demand is negative, we're looking at an inferior situation or an inferior quantity demanded at any given price, uh, it decreases when your income rises. Sometimes people buy less of some items when their income increases. That's considered inferior products. A consumer buys less of any food as their income rises. So that's why we need the negative and positive uh, to differentiate between those two. The last elasticity is the price elasticity of supply. The price elasticity of supply it relates to the suppliers of goods and services, and it measures the responsive behavior of the quantity of any good produced or supplied to the price of that good. And the solutions are expressed in absolute value. So when we're looking at price of assisted supplies to measure responsive behavior of the quantity of the good supply to a change in the price of that good in the market. So we're looking at the formula, the price of elasticity of supply, is the percent change in the quantity supply of goods and services divided by the percent change in prices. The elasticity of supply actually measures how suppliers of goods and services respond to changes in prices. Are they gonna supply significantly more due to price changes or significantly less due to price changes? And we can analyze this in percentages or in calculations when we're analyzing the elasticity of supply. So, for example, suppose we have uh, farmers and milk producers that experience a price increase. We have the price, in this case, increasing from $2.85 uh, divided up to $3.50. The quantity produced at $2.85, it was 9000 but with the slight increase in 30 cents, uh, uh, this is uh, 20 cents, just an increase in 20 cents, it increases production to 11,000. That's significantly more. We need to calculate the price elasticity of supply using the midpoint method. 
uh, and then solve the, uh, the quantity and the price situations along the formula application. So elasticity of supply formula, Q2 minus Q1 divided by the average value, Q1 plus Q2 divide this by two, here we have it in this case, the other one, that two was not there, uh, or divide over change in prices. Price two minus price one divided by price one plus price two divided by two. This allows us to do the average value and follow the formula. We plug in the information, Q2 is uh, 11,000, Q1 is the original quantity divided by the average value of quantities. And we take a look at the different changes in prices. The prices increased to $3.15 minus 285 divided by the average value of prices. And once we go through the calculations, uh, we need to do the top first, the top portion first. We have 0.20 changes in quantity demand. The quantity uh, supply has increased by 0.20. And the price change, we have a change in price of 0.10. Divide those uh, together, and we have price elasticity of supply equivalent to two. We need to take the absolute value again for price elasticity of supply and price elasticity of demand only. The solution is positive, it's greater than one. Therefore, if the solution is greater than one, we have a price elastic condition. Producers respond significantly a lot in production to a small change in price. And if you notice here, the production increases from 9,000 to 11,000. Just by increasing price by 20 cents, you produce 2,000 units more. And that may potentially increase the revenue as well. Uh, so they're highly responsive. We also have extreme situations in supply uh, when it comes to elasticity. And the first situation is when we have uh, the price elasticity of uh, supply significantly vertical. This is actually more relevant to um, art rather than actual uh, products that are um, not relevant. So we have rare art. I like to use the art scenario because art is actually uh, one of those uh, situations that is very expensive and, and people that love art uh, can attest to the expensiveness of art. Perfectly inelastic supply. If the price elasticity of supply is equivalent to zero, the supply of that good, and this is why I decided to uh, select art, it's vertical in this case. We only have a hundred paints of Pablo Picasso. That's a limited amount. And uh, if we were to buy them at $25, we would still only have 100. If we increase the price to $100, we still have the original 100 um, and nothing more. This is important because if the quantity supply is limited, or the price elasticity of supply is equal to zero or perfectly inelastic, the suppliers cannot produce more. There's no way to produce uh, more of the units given the resources, the production line, even if price increases. So if you increase the price to 1,000, to 10,000, to 100,000, there is still only 100 units available. So in the string situation, when the supply of the good it's limited and there's no way to produce more of that product, the higher the price of the good leaves the quantity supply unchanged. This is price elasticity of supply when it's equivalent to zero or perfectly inelastic. Perfectly inelastic supply curves are always vertical. The supply of the good is limited. There's no way to produce more. Uh, so if the price increases, it, 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 the, it will, there will only still be one unit. Uh, so this is when paints are sold for half a million dollars, a million dollars, you're still only half one paint. And that's why it's so rare. In the other extreme situation, I'm still using the example of pizza, because a supplier of the product can also supply the good at an infinite, uh, at a set price. 
if we have the pizzeria companies that are now competing on price, they can set a standard price of five dollars, and at that specific price, the quantity supply or the supply of the good can be infinitely large. At exactly five dollars, producers can produce an infinite quantity, significantly large quantities. This is a great example of the company that you may be thinking in your mind uh, that sells pizzas at five five ninety nine. Uh, the consumer can demand an infinitely large quantity. I will recommend eating pizza every day of the week and, or, or every day, uh, every month or every year, but the supply can be infinitely large at a standard price. In this case, when you have price elasticity of supply being elastic, and think of elastic as highly responsive, large quantities at a standard price, perfectly inelastic. Uh, we're going to conclude the session of elasticity with, in this case, the perfectly elastic supply curve that is horizontal. And any other price could affect the supply of the good, whether it's above or below of the product when we have perfectly elastic supply curves. The infinite, infiniteness is very important. Now, what factors determine the supply of goods? Um, of course, the amount of inputs that are available, the resources that are available, the production line of the product, if there's not enough of them, the supply curve is inelastic. If there's a lot of inputs, the supply curve is highly elastic. Over time, uh, producers and consumers and society become highly responsive and highly elastic. So as well with demand and supply in this case, over time, producers have more time to adjust to production changes and increase by in, in increasing prices and increase the production line and become more responsive. But in the short term, they are limited to what they have. So long run elasticities tend to be greater than short run elasticities. What I mean by that is that in the long run, we have time to be responsive, time to adjust, which is elasticity, elastic behavior, highly responsive behavior becomes more possible in the long run than in the short-term behavior when we have some limitations or some constraints and our behavior is inelastic in the short term, a little bit more towards the inelastic side. 